we can go ahead and get started. Um, so their first story is Lit in a Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving. So as far as um, American literature goes, Washington Irving was really, well, he's not our first fiction writer, but he's probably our first uh, well, well respected fiction writer, you know, in our American tradition. You know, if you, uh, anytime you take a course on American literature, early American literature, Washington Irving is one of the first people you, you would probably read. Um, yeah, you know, he grew up during the early days of the American Republic. You know, he, he mostly, he was born in 1783. He mostly started writing by the time, by about 1820 or so. So he was about, uh, 30, 40 years old when he first wrote Sleepy Hollow, something like that. So he was from, he was from upstate New York. That's where most of the stories take place, up in upstate New York. Um, that's part of our setting for Sleepy Hollow, upstate New York. He's also known for the story Rip Van Winkle, all right, about the story about the guy who falls asleep he falls asleep when the British still uh, are over the American colonies and he wakes up during the new American nation, right? So he sleeps for 20 years. So he, he wrote that story too. So the two, those are the two main stories he's, he's famous for. He did a lot of other interesting stuff. Um, he tried to be a history writer he wrote one of the first biographies about George Washington, which, which is interesting. I would actually like to read that. I bet that would be interesting. Um, yeah, as far as, as far as our tradition of, of literature goes, he's one of the first prominent writers that we, that we had. Before that, in American literature, it was mostly just um, letters and documents and things like that. If you would ever, if you would ever take a class on American lit, especially the early, up to the Civil War, pretty much everything up to the revolutions, just letters and essays and stuff like that. It's really not any fiction much. So uh, he's one of our first in that regard. So uh, Sleepy Hollow. This is the start of our class on the Gothic. Um, so I'll just, I'm just going to turn the floor over to you guys. What, what did, what was going on with your reading of Sleepy Hollow? What did you find interesting about it? Uh, the main, like one of the first things that jumped out to me was just the atmosphere that he described for it. He described it as being kind of like mysterious and spooky but not as much in a scary way as a creativity, like a, something that provoked creativity. Like I didn't get an overall menacing vibe from the area. Honestly, if Sleepy Hollow was real, I'd love to live there. Just the way that he described it. Uh -huh. uh, a couple other things. There was also a hesitancy or kind of dislike for, uh, hold on, for modern advances. He talked about the city people being like, I didn't, I don't have a quote for that one, but in the very beginning, at the very end, he talks about, you know, people who aren't from there kind of don't have the same vibe, I guess. Right. Yeah, I think you're right to kind of hone in on setting, right? The story is all about the, the setting, you know, the idea of Sleepy Hollow, right? Is, is that Sleepy Hollow, the town? itself is pretty much a character, you know, in this, uh, you know, in this text. Um, we can, we can ground ourselves in the text here in a second to, to build off of your, uh, build off of your point. Ryan, Lauren, uh, what did you, what did you guys find interesting about Sleepy Hollow? It mentioned something about the Headless Horseman, right. which I, I'm a really big fan of the Headless Horseman myself, and the fact that the Headless Horseman is in here was very interesting to me. This is where that comes from, right? 
And from the first few pages, it seems to kind of talk about the Headless Horseman's life before he died, with his head being chopped off by a cannon. Which is very interesting to me. I very bad at words. <laughs> I can't really think of a way to articulate it better. Yeah, so he they describes the headless horseman, the legend is he's a during the revolution, um, the English didn't really send their own armies over to fight Americans. English hired mercenary armies of Germans. They were called uh, I think the Hessians. They would send mercenary armies over who were mostly German Germans, you know, to fight the war. And that's that's who the headless horseman is rumored to be, a fallen uh, German soldier during the revolution, right? Who had his head blown off by a cannon. So, yeah. On that note, I I enjoyed how uh, they kind of continued that thread throughout, where in like his final ride, Crane goes past the locust tree where it talks about the whole thing happened. Right. Yeah, that, that's where the soldier died, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Lauren, uh, Lauren, you want to jump in? What did you... Uh... Uh, something that stuck out to me for some reason, while I was reading it, I knew that the Headless Horseman was this somebody that they said was from the Revolutionary War. But for me, the way that Ichabon Crane was so interested in all the mysterious stuff happening, I thought for sure for a little while that he was actually the Headless Horseman. Right. Yeah, you know, that, that is interesting, right? Um, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm definitely not discounting that as, as a possibility, right? because really the only time Headless Horseman, nobody saw Crane and the Headless Horseman together. Right, at any given point. Reading through it whenever it what's his name? The other person, the other man that was interested in Karen uh, Van Brom. What was her name? Uh, yeah, Brom. Yeah. I thought it was interesting to me when I was reading through it, it talked about him playing pranks on everyone and kind of just being a big prankster. I kind of got the thought and the idea that Ichabon was going to pretend to be the headless horseman and scare him. Right. Yeah, it's, it's sort of implied that maybe it was Brom Bones who was pretending to be the horseman, right? Mm -hmm. to, to scare Ichabod away from from Katrina. So, uh, so yeah, that that's interesting. Now we don't we don't get any definitive answers in the story to any of this, right? I think that's one interesting thing about it we don't get a, resolu a resolution at all you know normally uh, no let me let me pull this up this will be a good uh, thing to talk about on the first day we discuss a story in literature class Um, yeah, you see here, this is, this is the famous plot triangle, right? I don't know if you guys have went, done this kind of thing before in high school. This is the, this is the plot triangle. So you, you start with some exposition, right? Which we get plenty of. Irving gives us lots of exposition early. You have your rising action right your climax that's this is your climax is when crane runs from the goes from the party and sees the horseman right and then the resolution is how a story is usually in All right so this is the classic um and this is the classic plot plot diagram as far as how stories function all right, so it is interesting that we don't have any of this here. All right, we have zero resolu resolution. The narrator, the narrator of the story, that's something we should, that's probably, that's probably something we should probably talk about here. 
what's the role of the narrator in the story? Usually with narrators, you're going to see this for Thursday when we talk about Edgar Allan Poe. Usually narrators, we have several different types of narrators. Right? We have um, the third, what's called a first person narrator. Usually a first person narrator is telling an account of what happened to himself, right? So you sometimes have, you can't always trust the first person narrator to always tell the truth. And that's how, that's what we're going to encounter Thursday. We also have a couple of different types of third person narrators. Right? One type of a third person narrator is an omniscient narrator. Right? The narrator knows everything about what's, what happens in the story. Right? The narrator can give us all the answers. Right? That's not really what we have here, it, seem, it seems, right? because our narrator, our narrator does not know all the answers. And then there's the type of narrator that's limited, right? a third person limited narrator. And that's uh, really what we have here. Right? One thing that, like, I think throughout the story, the narrator to me seemed on the omniscient at first, but then at the part where uh, Katrina whispers something to Ichabod and then that leads up to his big dash with the Headless Horseman, it really kind of got me there because that was the only point where they were holding out on us. Right. At that and the end where there was no resolution. Yeah, that's, that is interesting, right? I was, I was kind of thinking the same thing as I was rereading it today. It's like this. Seems like a third person omniscient narrator, and then boom, he's like, I don't know what she said. Mm -hmm. And it makes you think if you don't know what she said, then how do you know about the chase or any of that at all? Right. Yeah, after that, it could just be old wives' tales or rumors. Well, I don't know. It seems to be what the narrator is going off of there, like rumors going about about what actually happened to the Ichabod. He gives us he gives us possibilities. Ichabod might have died, right? He might have just went to a different town, and took on a different life. Right? I think it said he becomes like a judge or something like that. Mm -hmm. right? so, yeah, it, it's it's so it is interesting then that uh, probably four fifths of the way into the story, suddenly he's like, I don't know everything. Right, so that that kind of took me off guard too. One other thing that I noticed that really irked me, it's not really on the point of the narrator, but I noticed a lot of misogyny throughout the whole thing. Right. And the <laughs> one main part that got me, ignore the bird, he's he's loud. Um, the one part that got me, I got a quote for this one. He says, some have but one vulnerable point, others have a thousand avenues, it is a great triumph or a great triumph of skill to gain the former, but still greater to maintain possession of the latter. And it just <clears throat> kind of pent, like highlighted to me that the women in the story played a kind of passive role. Yeah, that's a, that's a good quote you bring up. I actually wrote that one down, down too. It talks about, it, it mentions this idea of the coquette right that's the that's the word that it uses and that back in the day in the 1800s you know the night that word in the late 1700s too that word had an association of like this flirty woman it's kind of like is a it's pretty much the 18th century word for slut right that's kind of that's pretty much what coquette means I mean, he kind of he kind of signifies that Katrina kind of gets around right? and another thing that got me is that it caught like the story contradicted itself because then I think it might be before or after that Katrina's mother is talking about how she has to keep a closer eye on the chickens because girls are smart and can take care of themselves and it's just a little bit of an inconsistency for me Right. Yeah, the pass the passage in question that you mentioned. I'll read the whole thing just because I think it's interesting. He said the narrator uses the first person here. 
He says, I profess not to know how women's hearts are wooed and won. To me, they have always been matters of riddle and admiration. Some seem to have but one vulnerable point or door of access, while others have a thousand avenues and may be captured a thousand different ways. It is a great triumph of skill to gain the former, but a still greater proof of generalship to maintain possession of the latter, where a man must battle for his fortress at every door and window. He that, he that wins a thousand common hearts is therefore entitled to some renown, but he who keeps undisputed sway over the heart of a coquette is indeed a hero. Certain it is, this was not the case with the redoubtable Brom Bones, and from the moment Ichabod Crane made his advances, the interests of the former evidently declined. declined. His horse was no longer seen tied at the palings on Sunday nights, and a deadly feud gradually arose between him and the preceptor of Sleepy Hollow. All right, so yeah it's you're right there that's a great good passage illustrating some uh misogyny right it's like it's almost like a ha 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 sort of women right that's, that's kind of that's kind of what the uh, irving seems to be doing here another parallel that i thought was interesting between brawn and crane was talking about their horses when they were going to the celebration. So Crane got the uh, really mean-tempered one from the house that he was staying at. And side note, I thought it was funny. The rider doesn't know horses very well because draft horses or plow horses usually are very, very docile in nature anyway. So, um, and then it talks about bronze horse being young and healthy, still having that uh, bad attitude and the meanness, but just Ichabod's is broken down and unwell, and then you get to the other one. It's healthy and fit and everything. Right. You, what kind of, uh, you think that has a deeper meaning of some sort, maybe about Ichabod and Brahms characters? Mm -hmm. I think it kind of is meant to mirror them in a way. Right, yeah, Brahms, Ichabod, seems he seems to be sort of churlish right he seems to be um, he doesn't want to get in fist fights or anything like that right he goes about his business relatively passively it seems he knows he can't beat big brawn brawn bones in a fight right so he, he doesn't even attempt to go there he attempts to win katrina with with his mind and not his uh masculine prowess so to speak um it was kind of obvious to me i don't know about y'all but ichabod from my reading of it ichabod was definitely in it for the money because you know he goes to the farm and he, there's a lot of time in the story spent describing the farm and how wonderful and peaceful it is and then there's that moment of ah oh, there's katrina what if I married her and then so on and so on? Right. Yeah, Nicole, I think you're right there. You know, this this goes back to this old idea of, um, you know, what happens when you mar get married. You know, back in the 1800s, 1700s, oftentimes, uh, of course, I, I'm sure some of you guys may know this, some of you might not, but oftentimes. Um, of course, the way property was passed down was to male children, right? usually the firstborn. So what tended to happen with women, with female children, they were economic burdens to their dads, right? So by the time they got to be of age, the dad would put something on to sweeten the deal, someone to actually marry the girl. Right, so he would put a dowry on, on uh, the female. You know, here here's some here's some money. Right, here's some land you can get if you do decide to marry her. So oftentimes uh, marriages happen not out of love, but out of uh, out of financial reasons. Just like uh, he sees he sees a uh, sugar mama here, so so to speak. Right. Mm -hmm. Back then, the only people that could marry for love were the poor people. 
right? <laughs> that, that's pretty much it. Right? Only, you know, lots of merit. There's lots of story, romance stories of, you know, the woman going for a poor guy or the, the man who loves a poor woman but has to enter a marriage of inconvenience, right? There's, there's lots of uh, old stories like that. Any of you guys are familiar with? Back then, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, back then, really, the only way to change stations was to marry. Right. If you married up or down, either way. Yeah. Often, if, of course, the old American, the you know, old American ideals, the American dream. Right. You can. You can uh, advance from where you're born and become something new entirely, right? That's early in the American Republic. That was especially true, right? You could, back then, you could just move somewhere and claim a piece of land for yourself and become a farmer, right? You know, it's, it was easier then to follow the American dream than it is now in many ways. But yeah, you're right. I mean, especially in Europe, this was a way of social advancement. Right? If you could find a, if a man could find a woman with a big enough dowry, right, that that provides some security to uh, to the man. Oftentimes, the dowry would be paid out of, every year by the father. Right? Sometimes it all came in like one big lump sum. Right? So it is it is interesting for for sure. It's, Sometimes fathers who had a lot of daughters had a hard time because they had to get all these different dowries together. And so it was, if you guys, if you guys are familiar with Jane Austen's fiction, right? Jane Austen, this is, this type of thing is what she pretty much wrote all of her sort of novels about this, this marriage economy, you know, that took place around this time. Have you ever read any Jane Austen, uh, Nicole? A bit, but not much. Yeah. You know, Pride and Prejudice is her most uh, famous novel. That's really the only one I've read. Um, but it, you know, that pretty much all of her fiction deals with this kind of thing. So yeah, it is. It's interesting then that we're talking about all these different characters right instead of the spooks of the stories so to speak because he does spend so much time developing these characters just a few this story is like 20 pages long or something like that mm -hmm. like 41 41 on the pdf mm -hmm. one thing that i thought was really interesting about like the ghosts and goblins and everything is that especially with the horsemen you know you talk about it scaring people but really, other than just running beside somebody, it never did anything malicious. Like with all of the things they talk about, they never really hurt anyone, they just frighten people. And it leaves you to wonder if there even is anything or if these people are just wanting things to be there and wanting something to get excited about or frightened about. Right. Now, this is a good chance to go back and to what you were talking about earlier with setting see if we can figure out what's going on with setting. I think that's probably got a little something to do with with that point. Um, yeah, early early in the story, let's see. I've got, I'm using a textbook that I have this in, so I'm using a different version than you all. But the third paragraph in the story, this is where we get um, setting. So he says, from the listless repose of the place and the peculiar character of its inhabitants, who are descendants from the original Dutch settlers, this sequestered glen has long been known by the name of Sleepy Hollow, and its rustic lads are called the Sleepy Hollow Boys throughout all the neighboring country. A drowsy, dreamy influence seems to hang over the land to pervade the very atmosphere. Some say that the place was bewitched by a high German doctor during the early days of the settlement. Others that an old Indian chief, the prophet or wizard of his tribe, held his powwows there before the country was discovered by Master 
Henry Hudson. Certain it is, this play, the play still continues under the sway of some witching power. It holds a spell over the minds of the good people, causing them to walk in a continual reverie. They are given all kinds of marvelous beliefs, have trances and visions, and see strange sights and hear music and voices in the air. The whole neighborhood abounds with local tales, haunted spots, and twilight superstitions. Stars shoot and meteors glare, oftener across the valley than in any other part of the country. And the nightmare with her whole nine fold seems to make it as the favorite scene of her gambles. Yeah. So that the passage that I just read, right? It kind of you know, it kind of illustrates the importance of setting here, especially. Mm -hmm. So so here's here's a question for the for the two of you, right? Um, do you guys think that this is a gothic sort of class? Do you guys think that some settings have this sort of uh, weird, uncanny atmosphere about them, like Sleepy Hollows described here? Do you know of such places? Mm, yes, I think so. Uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, Glenn Rogers is one that comes to me that kind of has that atmosphere. <laughs> and really, I think that it's kind of the people that make it that way. Right. I think that people play a big, big role in that as far as, you know, carrying on tales and superstitions, as well as being what it's like, what they're about. All right. Lauren, you got any thoughts on this? This question. I agree with what she's saying, but I don't really have a place that I think of whenever I read this story. But I do believe that if somebody says something about it and then they just keep talking about it and talking about it and talking about it, then it will normally just start talking like that, be there like that. Mm -hmm. And I think the places that are really the most susceptible to that are like how the writer with this talks about the long like Dutch heritage that has been continued there. I think that in places that's like small towns where it's the same few families, I think are more susceptible to that. Right. <laughs> yeah, stories get passed down across generations and new details get embellished every time the story's retold, right? New details are added. And so by the time you get from the story 40 years after it's first told it's a completely different story right so that's that's kind of like how folklore and things like that work i know this freud called this type of thing uh, the uncanny that's what that was the word that he used to describe this the uncanny um You know, let me, let me read you a good definition of it. <clears throat> it says, the uncanny is the psychological experience of something as strangely familiar rather than simply mysterious. It may describe incidents where a familiar thing or event is encountered in an unsettled, unsettling, eerie, or taboo context. It says the uncanny places us in the field where we do not know how to distinguish bad and good, pleasure from displeasure, resulting in an irreducible anxiety that gestures to the real. Yeah, that's so gothic fiction plays a lot on this, right? This idea of the uncanny, right? Something something that we just can't quite describe, right? Something we just can't put our minds around. You know, that becomes unsettling and gives us anxiety about about the police. I know of one place pretty close that gives me this vibe. Um, I don't know. Have you guys ever seen? Have you guys ever been to the old Lake Shawnee in Mercer County? Right, the old amusement park. Right, you you've been there, Nicole. Yeah. I've not been like on it, but I drive by it pretty frequently and it does, it's very spooky. Yeah, it's, it's on it's on that road when you go past Herndon Mountain and going back towards Princeton, that's where the 
that's where the place is. But yeah, it's, it's, I, it, it gives me that spooky feeling just because there's it's been rumored that there's lots of supernatural stuff that happens there. There was a couple, it was, so back in the 1700s, like this family was massacred by Indians there. And then later they built an amusement park and several children died there in like accidents. So yeah, the that sort of way that he describes Sleepy Hollow here, this dreamy like feel in the air, right? That I kind of get that vibe mm -hmm. at that place. One other place that gives me that kind of like eerie feeling is the uh Stonehaven building in uh Itman. I've actually me and a couple friends have snuck all through that and it's definitely haunted. I mean for sure. <laughs> talking about the old homeless shelter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah I've, I've never been in that building. I've driven by it a million times. So I've never been in there. I've been all through it except for the basement. I don't know what it was. I just you couldn't pay me to go in that basement at all. No amount of money. Yeah, back in uh, November, I did a tour of the um, asylum in Westland. Uh, you know, you guys probably know about that asylum for the criminally insane up at up at Westland. It was closed down around like 1995 or so. Like there's all kind. Of, that place is said to be haunted by lots of different ghosts and stuff like they do i went on a paranormal tour of uh of the place back in back in november it, it, it gives you that vibe too it's just like you know that there's lots of history you know that happened in these walls right lots of them unfortunate stuff happened to people who were stuck there um, lobotomies murders all kinds of crazy stuff happened in that place. So it kind of, that place kind of gives that feeling too. You know, I didn't see anything particularly weird while I was there, but, but still, you know, of course, so the question is, is this our minds just messing with us or is it really a, a real feeling? I guess that's really the question we can, we can ask ourselves here. I think that's a hard one. I think, you know, when we get that feeling, a lot of times it discourages us to go any further wherever we're, you know, we're at, wherever we get that feeling. And I think the only way to really have any sense of if it's like, if it's true or not is to go, is to go keep going and push past that feeling. Like in Stonehaven, I know without a doubt that, that place is haunted because there were doors with, that were opening and closing where there were no open windows, no draft possible. There was no one else in the building except me and two people and I had eyes on them. And like, you know, you can't find out unless you really go further into it. Yeah, when I was at the uh, asylum in Weston, the, the tour guide put like this old school flashlight in her room. When she was supposedly talking to some spirit, she's like, turn the flashlight on and off in response to my questions and like it was it came on and off whenever she asked it something so uh, i don't see how she could have faked that just because it was such an old old flashlight like you know, it wasn't it wasn't like a phone or something this was an old old flashlight so that was that was weird right so that's probably the type of experience you described with the doors opening and shutting and whatnot. That's kind of that's kind of the one experience that I've gotten in that way. All right, so yeah, interesting, uh, interesting stuff here. You know, this is kind of a common experience to to us all in many ways. Now, Lauren, you said that you uh, you didn't know of any such places. Are you a believer in this supernatural type stuff, Lauren? I am a believer, but I tend to keep myself away from places where people are talking about them being haunted and everything. Right. My, my friends last year, their trade school class went to the Trans-Allegheny Asylum. That's what I'm talking about. Yep. Away from them for like a week. <laughs> 
Did, did they did they tell you about any weird experiences they might have? uh yeah in one of the rooms they had a flashlight on the table and it would go on and off by itself and in one of the rooms they'd have all kinds of like balls and stuff in there and they said that you could hear them bouncing off the walls and everything with nobody even in there yep the story the story you talked about the flashlight that's what i experienced while i was while i was there and even like the groans and eight noise weird noises you hear and the silence and stuff yeah that that's interesting this is gonna sound crazy but the first time i started believing in anything like this was at my grandmother's house because she lives in what used to be an old coal town in a house that was originally one bedroom one bathroom like one big room and a bathroom that was a coal house and where the original door was is boarded up and there's a big china cabinet on one side of it and then like a game room on the other and when i was little every night at three o'clock you would hear three knocks on that door that used to be the door to the house but it's now closed up every single night and uh my uncle mac one time went in there and he was like i'm gonna see what it wants and just trying to fool with it whatever it was and went in there and started running his mouth and talking to it and the cat, the child, like the big, huge china cabinet started shaking and like a bunch of china fell out of it. And that from that point on, I was like, no, no, thanks. <laughs> I'm checking out from here. Right? Yes, yeah, so Lauren's probably the, the smart one here and right? she stays away from from such phenomena. For sure. There's always the classic trope in horror films with where um certain characters are like hell no i'm not going in there or any. <laughs> yeah as far as setting goes right irving probably succeeds almost better than anybody right creating this type of spooky atmospheric setting up in the new england up in new england up in new, upper state new york of course, the same the same kind of thing is said the people feel that when they go to Salem right because of the Salem witch trials that's the book that Irving keeps mentioning that Ichabod has by the way Cotton Mather's uh, account of the Salem witch trials he was one of the judges who was presiding over it he he wrote a book about New England witchcraft and stuff when he was is that the one that today is called the crucible or is that a different account that's the Cotton Mather's thing inspired that, but that's that was a play before it was a um, a movie. So yeah, it's about the Salem witch trials and stuff. Good movie. It's got um, Gary Oldman in it. Not Gary. What's this? Daniel Day Lewis. Daniel Day Lewis is in it. Well, I know I remember he's in it too. Yeah, that New England, New England said people people go there seeking thrills, right? Salem's a popular tourist attraction these days because people want to people want to experience that type of uncanny uncanny feeling even by vacationing there. So let's. Uh, Let's segue over into talking about characters. I mean, we should probably, we've talked about the setting and the general plot. Maybe, maybe let's figure out what's going on with some of these characters. What about, so Ichabod's our main character here, right? So, I don't know. I'll ask, I'll ask you this, Lauren. How would you describe Ichabod? Like, what's he like as a person? Uh, I know that he's very tall and lanky, but I feel like even though he's a school teacher, he might still be kind of like kind of creepy, especially as much as he likes the superstitious stuff and tries to follow it everywhere. Right. So very tall, lanky, right? His interests seem a little seem a little weird, right? He, his one book that he has is about New England witchcraft, right? <laughs> which is which is interesting. Right. 
Yeah, I agree with everything Lauren said. I think that, you know, he was tall, lanky. He had kind of peculiar tastes and just a little bit too enthusiastic about spooky things, I feel like. (laughs) One thing, though, he was definitely aware of his impressions, like how people thought of him, because it talked about, like, trying to stay in the good graces of everyone that he stayed with. Uh, trying to call the little children more so the wives liked him and also as a teacher it talked about he wasn't a cruel teacher but whenever uh, he would like spare the young ones that were kind of timid and seemed like they had enough punishment at home and then the ones that ran rampant he kind of went a little I don't know if I'd say overboard but was very stern with them right. yeah he would it, it was said he would punish the the kids who he felt could endure the punishments he, he punished those kids more than than the timid ones who doing that too would break them maybe so he has a good sense as for you know who can bear the brunt of such things it doesn't it doesn't seem like he's a sadist who gets off on beating the children or anything but it seemed like he has a good idea who he can cross that line with and we can't and i don't know if he was truly very religious but it made a point of him being a singing master in church and always be singing from psalms right yeah i forgot i forgot about that detail so he seems to me when reading that it felt like it was a little bit more for show in the community like I'm sure he did enjoy singing but I feel like the fact that it was just a church organization was partially that that's probably the only community time they had back then and also just trying to stay in everyone's good graces and fit in right maybe it was a performance of some type that he's putting on just to just to get in everyone's good graces now he he seems like very conscientious person um he's described another attribute that you guys haven't mentioned is he's also described as being almost a sort of glutton right it talks about how he overstuffs himself with with food and the narrator spends an entire page describing the food at the katrina's celebration right which is uh, which is interesting but it talks about how Ichabod can't help but stuffing his fa- he can't help but stuff his face. Right? So it's interesting that he's got that kind of deadly sin about him, right? Gluttony. Uh, what it means, I don't I don't know if I have an answer to. Right? But he, that's one of his attributes. I think that was uh, portrayed really well in the uh, narrator's description of everything, like. I don't know. I just got a feeling of him being a glutton for food, for scenery, for just everything. Just anything good, he wanted an abundance of it. Not just what he needed, but just more so. Yeah, it, it, it describes him as when he thinks about Katrina, right? He thinks about the big feasts he's going to have for, for the rest of his life, right? So, <laughs> uh, it's not not about loving her it's about it's about you're gonna get steak every day for the the rest of your life so and honestly he doesn't seem like a very heroic type of type of character here right he's one he's a very famous character in our folklore and in our mythology these days um yeah every if you say Ichabod Crane, almost anybody, right? Every, almost anybody, even if they haven't ever read a story and talks about Sleepy Hollow. What about the uh, Brom Bones? What's going on with, with him as a character? We talked about how he's a trickster and stuff, stuff earlier. Anything else we might want to add to that? What I got from it, I just feel like he was your everyday cut of the mill, young, uh, fit person in a small community that wanted all the attention, like maybe a little bit of a narcissist. 
Yeah, he seems like a good old country boy. I think that seems to be that seems to be uh, the best way to describe him—a narcissist for sure. One thing that I thought whenever it was describing how you know they could often him and his buddies could be often heard out in the middle of the night hooping and hollering, I thought, well, I wonder if he has just been pranking these people, and there are actually no spirits or anything. It's just him playing tricks. That's a that's a good question. Um, so at the heart, I think that's that question you asked is at the heart of why this story is is good, right? Just because we don't know that answer, right? It does it leaves us room for for possibilities. So this is this is an attribute we're already identifying on day one a key attribute of of the gothic genre. And it's very rare that the gothic, a gothic story ends with certainty about what happens. Right? Oftentimes we're left in this sort of ambiguous state. Right? Was it at, was Sleepy Hollow actually haunted? Right? Or was it just was this guy playing a prank? Right? Um, I, think, I think one of the biggest reasons that that is so common in gothic literature is because at that period in time, we were obsessed with figuring everything out and answering questions and knowing everything. And one, I feel like one of humanity's biggest fears was not knowing and not being able to find out. Yeah, um, Gothic literature, you're right. Gothic literature is in many ways a response to the, to the enlightenment, right? The, the enlightenment. The enlight enlightenment was kind of what helped give birth to things like the American Revolution and the French Revolution and whatnot, right? It's this idea that we can finally separate knowledge from religion and superstition. Science can be separated from, should be separated from religion, right? This, this was the period of time where that's, that's when they actually first started doing that, right? They, you had uh, key figures like Sir Isaac Newton, right? John Locke all these philosophers, right, started the Immanuel Kant, right, all these philosophers started paving the way for, we can explain, we can explain most of the phenomenon in the world through science, right, not, and not superstition. So the Gothic's almost the response to that, right, this idea, this is still an idea we're grappling with today, right, there's a lot of this stuff does it have a scientific basis, right? Or is it is it superstition? Lots of times it is science and not and not uh, superstition. And then some people ask, does it have to have a scientific base in it to be valid? Right. How how, how do you how do you mean by that? Ah, uh, like some people, the importance of thing like to some people. It doesn't matter if science does back something up. It's still a staple in their life, in their own personal life. And because of that, they believe that it should be a staple in everyone's lives, which, you know, would be nice, but people in hell don't get, don't get ice water and we're not going to get what we want in life. Right. Yeah, I think, I think it's still a pretty common attribute that, um, Oftentimes, the more education someone has, the more inclined they are to being skeptical about this type of stuff. I think that's a pretty safe statement to make. Um, often, oftentimes, this type of superstition and stuff might happen in small towns, right, where many people might not be educated, right? I, I don't. I'm not. I don't trying to sound. I'm not trying to sound snobby here. I'm just trying to point out. It's, it's usually educated folks usually tend no, to No, you don't sound snobbish. You're right on point. Right. Yeah, educate even with religion and whatnot, right? Educated a lot of lots of times educated folks, not lots of educated folks are religious, but oftentimes they're more secular about the way they view the world than than uh, people who aren't. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I found that people in smaller areas like this don't realize that not every affair is a spiritual affair and that some things need to be logical. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, lots. I think I think you're right about that. Lots of times people have a religious ex answer for everything, right? So, yeah, that this is this is something else the gothic genre plays on, right? Is the audience right? Lots of times it tries. Lots of times these stories we'll read and we'll try to convince a skeptical audience about their truth. We'll find out. So um, sometimes these stories have skeptics who are who become believers. You know, during the course of of the story, we'll see a lot of that in this class. What do you guys? Um, or go ahead. Or are we still on the characters? Sure. Yeah. Uh, really, one thing that I noticed about Katrina is it really didn't describe her character very much. I mean, like, pretty much she was just a gateway to her family and to what they had. I felt like it described her father and her mother. Well, not so much her mother, but mainly her father more than it ever did her. Yeah, you're, I think you're exactly right, right? All we really get of her is she's a coquette, right? That's really the only description we get of her. It describes her looks, right? It talks about how she's plump and lively. And she's got the child-bearing hips. <laughs> that type of stuff, right? <laughs> that seems to be all we, that seems to be all we get of, of her here. All right. This this might be, of course, this is early 1800s. We got a male writer, right? So uh, it might be the limitations of this is an inter this is a question I'll ask you guys periodically throughout the course, especially especially the two of two of you as women, right? I'll be I'll be interested to know if you think male writers can write women well, right? That's all. That's oftentimes a question that comes up. Can men really write well about women? Um, arguably, arguably, Thank arguably, some of the greatest writers ever, right? Can't or don't understand women. Right? I think the big defining point for men who write women, really, you can get a sense of their view on femininity itself, and if they view that as a negative aspect or a positive aspect. And I think if they don't look at it, at it as either and they just look at it as a human aspect, I think they do women well. Right. If they view women as other humans and not based off the gender. Mm -hmm. I'm not just a female. Yeah. There's more to <laughs> than that. <laughs> what do you think, Lauren? Well, you can tell really if they go back to the 1800s whenever women were supposedly just housewives you can tell whenever the men are just stating that they are that and they're just seeing them as that and not actually like a human and then anytime in that era that men do write women there's a stereotype for you know the woman that wants to learn that wants to do this there's a certain archetype for them they don't really give much room as far as creativity like I can't enjoy you know, being an intellectual and being a wife, like I can't do that. It has to be one or the other. Right. Yeah, you're exactly right about that. Um, that trend continued all through the 1800s, into the 1900s. One, I wrote a um, part of my doctorate project. I wrote a chapter about women writers who wrote about medicine. There's lots of stories about women who try to become doctors, who, medical doctors. Like, that's pretty much the plot of all of them, right? Should they give up their career to get married or not, right? The man, the men oftentimes try to force them into not working to get when they get married. So that, you know, that's, that becomes the plot thread of a whole lot of books about women. It's interesting to see how women write those plots versus how men write those plots. And then on the same topic, like 
in store in like texts and stories where there's a woman who doesn't fit you know the normal archetype if there's a man in the same story who accepts that it's like they want you to view him as like a savior of some kind it's like no this is just how you should view women it's not like that should be special you shouldn't be thanked for it you shouldn't be praised for it it should just be the norm right you have a specific example here of ah, let me think no i can't think of one right off the top of my head i know there are a few that i've read but like right off the top of my head no Yeah, we're going to get um, several women writers in this class. We're going to get Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who's one of the iconic Gothic female writers. Um, Charlie Jackson, who, who wrote Haunting the Hill House. It'll be interesting to talk about how she writes women versus how, how men do. Well, Eleanor is the main character of, of that book. So we have a feminine protagonist in that one i'll be interested to see how you guys think about how poe writes women um you know for for our poe stories that we're reading now for for this story and for this writer i will say that necessarily writing the women in more and like developing their characters more i don't think would have done anything for the story because I don't think that that was the main focus of the story. I think this story was really about Ichabon and just about Sleepy Hollow in general. Right. So there wasn't much need to develop beyond just the fact that Ichabod wanted to mm -hmm. marry for money. Yeah, it is interesting that Brom gets all this development, but not, and even her dad, but not, not her though. And it is an interesting uh, limitation of the story. Um, there's been lots of adaptations of this this story um tim tim burton made a sleepy hollow movie back in the 90s i think have any of you guys ever seen it it's been a long time i don't remember much about it is johnny depp in that one johnny depp's in it i think i've seen, yeah, it, I've seen it but it's been a while you guys remember much about it Didn't he have an affair with someone's wife? No. There was something like that in there. If I, okay. I yeah. He embellished a lot of stuff into that story of his own. Um, I'm going to be interested to watch it again because it's been a long time since I've seen it. Yeah, Johnny Depp plays Ichabod, you know, if I, if I recall. Do you remember much of the movie, Lauren? You said you, you said you'd seen it. Uh, I haven't really watched it. I walked into my sister's room one time and watched about thirty minutes of it with her, but then I was done with it. I was too young to get interested into it. Right. I do remember the movie doing really well with atmosphere and setting. Like it definitely, I do remember that it definitely succeeded in giving that spooky feeling of a sleepy hollow that the that the story describes. Mm -hmm. I think it captured the way that Sleepy Hollow was written really well, though I think it took it a little bit more maliciously than I personally did, and it gave it that more darker overtone. But I don't think it was a bad choice. I think it was just a choice. Kind of made it almost like the little Red Riding Hood scary. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like what the, the movie did. Kind of made it like that. Yeah, Irving, I was reading before class, Irving took a lot of inspiration for both of these his famous stories, Rip Van Winkle and this, from German you know, folklore tales. So like the grim fairy tales and things like that he would have been very familiar with. Of course, you guys know the grim fairy tales are pretty messed up if you read the original, the original versions you know, compared to... Like the original Little Red Riding Hood is much more messed up than the than the watered down version that we're told as kids. <laughs> very, very much more so. Mm. 
Yeah, it's something that I haven't studied much. I would be interested in reading more about. I don't. I've never read a lot of of the of those. Yeah, a good story to start the class on. It seems um, our next writer is almost nothing in common with Irving. So this will be Poe. So this will be this will be good to see what you guys think about think about him. So the two stories we're reading for Thursday are the Black Cat and the Imp of the Perverse. The Black Cat. The Black Cat's my favorite of of his stories. I think it's very effective. I'm sure all of you, both of you, probably read Telltale Heart before, right? Am I right in saying that? Yeah, it's a very, it's a very similar story to, to the Telltale Heart. Um, I never assign the Telltale Heart in my classes because I usually assume that people have read it before. Sometimes I'm wrong in my assumption, but um, the Black Hat isn't read as much, so I'll be interested to see what you guys think of that one. The Imp of the Perverse is, the Imp of the Perverse, as you guys will find out, it starts a little slow. Um, it, it's almost like this philosophical essay on being wicked and evil and all this stuff before it jumps into things happening in the story. I would recommend that you read The Black Cat first. Read The Black Cat first because it'll give you a way into reading The Imp of the Perverse. This, it, it, both stories uh, talk about the same idea, this idea of perverseness, which I will be interested to hear you guys talk about. So remember your discussion post for Thursday. I'll look at, the, at them right before class. Class starts at 3.30. You can get them in there by three. I'll be happy just so I can review them before class. So um, yeah, get them in before three. That'll work. Okay. Remember, remember to develop your response with um, textual support, right? Like, like how I, we, I read passages from the text today. Right? Try to anchor yourself in, in the text whenever you do your response. So yeah, good, good first day of discussion, guys. Every class is like this. It will be, it will be great. All right. So. That's probably enough for today then, so we can end it end it there. See you Thursday. See ya. See ya. See ya.